So I came across this quote in my study this week. It said, everything in the local church rises or falls with leadership. What do you think? Fair statement or not? I guess personally, sometimes whenever I hear language like everything, anything, nothing, I'm like, that's a strong statement. You better back it up. But I, we could quibble about that. I think you could just take that out and say the local church rises or falls with leadership. Go show me a healthy church. And I bet one of the key ingredients of that is going to be healthy leadership. Show me a struggling church. And I bet one of the missing things will be strong leadership. And if you're struggling with that concept, it's really not just true of the church. This is true in business. This is true in government. Can I get an amen from the congregation? This can be true in all kinds of institutions, even sports teams, right? There needs to be strong leadership. And so when we think through a church, and I'm assuming that if you're here and you consider this your church, we're all on the same page. Well, I'd rather this be a a healthy, strong church than a weak, unhealthy one. Well, if we want that, then we need strong leaders. And that's the focus of our seventh distinctive today. And if you're thinking, well, man, this is great. I can just kick my feet up for this message. I'm not a leader at this church. Uh, So I can just sit back. Listen, I might not even take notes today. Let me remind you, you have a vested interest in this topic as you want this to be a healthy church. And also you may have more of a role to play in this than you think. So let's take our Bibles, let's open them up together, and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 5 today to give us biblical direction as we consider our seventh distinctive as a church. We will look to authentic and sacrificial leaders. And again, we describe this on our website this way. The kind of people that God calls to lead at Compass Bible Church is extremely important. Obviously, our pastors and teachers must meet the biblical qualifications as set forth in the books of 1 Timothy and Titus. Beyond that, we expect our leaders to follow in the Apostle Paul's example of being authentic, forthright, honest, hardworking, and sacrificial. In a phrase, we expect that our leaders set the example of saying to Christ daily, anything, any place, any time. That's what we think God expects of leaders, and that's what we want to expect of leaders at our church. And let's see why as we look at 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5. It says, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So there, as we look, uh, Peter is talking to the elders at in these churches that he is writing to. And he identifies himself as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. In that sense, I don't think he means so much as an eyewitness, but as someone who has borne witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. I think that's a foreshadowing of verse 4. But he calls on the elders and tells them to shepherd and exercise oversight. And all of those are very important biblical words because each of them is essential to helping us understand God's ideal and God's plan for the leadership in a local church. So let's put this down for point number one as we talk about these terms. Understand God's plan for church leadership. Understand God's plan for church leadership. And even as you're writing that down, think about three words with me. And I want you to think if we just took a poll of the average, probably kind of conservative evangelical in America, how would they explain these three words, elder, pastor, and bishop? 
elder, pastor, bishop. Now, again, I bet if you ask the average uh, conservative evangelical in America, they would probably say something like this. Well, elders are the leaders of the church that aren't on staff at the church. Pastors are the leaders at the church that are on staff at the church. And we don't have bishops because I'm not Catholic or Anglican, right? That that's probably what your average conservative evangelical, I think, would say. But if you study the Bible you would see those are not three different words to describe three different offices. They are three different words that describe one office. Those words are used interchangeably and synonymously in the New Testament. Elders are pastors, are bishops. Now, bishop, again, is an older word. If you look at the English Standard Version, that word will be translated overseer. Those come from three different Greek words. But again, this isn't the only place like this. There's other things in life where you might use uh, the same or describe the same office with different words. If you think about, for instance, who's in charge of a baseball team, you might call him the manager. That's the most technical title. You may just call him coach or you maybe call him something more informal. Hey, skipper, whatever it may be. But it's describing that same office. And here we see three different Greek words. The word elder comes from the Greek word presbyteros. So if you wonder, where did they get that Presbyterian name from? It comes from this Greek word. And that word can refer to older men in a kind of generic sense. But clearly in the Bibles, it's used of the men who are to be the leaders of the church. And they're not always old men. Think of Timothy. Let no one look down on your youth. There's presbyteros elder. Or then if you're saying, where does bishop come from? Or again, it's more translated overseer in more modern translations. That comes from the Greek word episkopos. So maybe it makes sense how the Episcopalians would use the term bishop, right? But it comes from that Greek word. And then the word pastor really comes from the Greek word translated shepherd, poimen. And and this makes more sense. Look with me now at the first verse and a half again. So I exhort the elders, presbyteros, among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd, that's the verb form of pastor, the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. That's a form of the word for overseer. So you you see, maybe if we broke those three words down, elder is more descriptive of who these men are. They're the men of maturity to lead the church. Pastor and overseer are words that more describe what they do. They are to shepherd and they are to oversee. And it's clear that this group of elders or pastors, overseers, every church should have a group like this. In Titus chapter 1, Titus is instructed to appoint elders in the churches on the island of Crete. And 1 Timothy 3, along with Titus 1, make it clear, well, what are you looking for in these men? First and foremost, character. They must be men of godly character. And even the word that's kind of the banner over all the more specific requirements is these men must be above reproach or blameless. Another thing that's important is they must be able to teach. They must be able to handle God's word. And so we see clearly from passages like this and Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 1 that churches are to be led by a team of qualified men who serve as the elders, pastors, overseers, right? Three different words for the same thing. I guess at our church, we lean more towards the word pastor, but that's just kind of, that's more cultural. You can call me elder. You could, I guess you could call me bishop, but that's kind of confusing. So maybe not, right? But there's three different words for the same thing. And I think the Bible makes some things clear. For instance, these should be men, which is, if if you've been paying any attention to news in Christian circles this week, a big point of discussion that I think the Bible is pretty clear on. For instance, if you just look at Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3, sure seems like it's talking about men, because I don't know how a woman can be the husband of one wife, right? Uh, and that might, unfortunately, that may start to make sense in the world we're living in, but it doesn't make sense in the real world or the biblical 
world, right? Also a passage like what you see at the end of 2 Timothy 2, which speaks of women not teaching or having authority over a man, I think all helps us see this picture that these leaders should be men. There are some hard parameters to this group of men that we see in the scriptures, especially in those character requirements. But there are some things about that team that the Bible doesn't speak as clearly to. For instance, how many elders should each church have? Should all of those elders be supported by the church and do, to do ministry, or should none of them be supported? And the Bible doesn't answer all those questions super clearly, and I think that's the wisdom of God, because there are some churches in a more affluent culture where all the leaders of the church can be supported and devote their full time to ministry, and there's probably other cultures or places where the church can't even afford to support one when there should be biblically many, that there should be a team of pastors, not just one. A plurality is the word you'll hear used a lot of elders, a team of men. So there's some things that different churches may do differently, and you'll see this. Different churches will set themselves up even organizationally in different ways, and you, you can talk about the pros and cons of that, but I think some people think, well, there's a perfect way to set it up that you won't have any problems. Unfortunately, I just don't think that's true. There's, there's really three things that you need. You need godly character, as we've already seen. That's what God makes clear. You also need doctrinal fidelity, because if you look at First and Second Timothy and Titus, we call those the pastoral epistles, because those books are really focused on training pastors. And you see one of the main things they're told to do over and over again is to teach, and they need to make sure that the wrong things aren't being taught and the right things are. There needs to be doctrinal fidelity, and there needs to be humble cooperation. If the church is meant to be led by a team of men, well, get people in a room making decisions, and I guarantee you at some point something's going to happen. There will be disagreement. So that group needs to be able to work through that humbly and cooperatively and come to a decision together. Godly character, doctrinal fidelity, and humble cooperation. And anywhere that you don't have one of those, if there is moral failure in leadership, if there is doctrinal drift in leadership, or if the leaders can't get along, the church is just going to have big problems. And I don't care how you have it set up, it, there's just going to be problems no matter how you slice it. So pray for those three things for your leaders, godly character, doctrinal fidelity, and humble cooperation. Now it is the, the elders or pastors that this passage is focused on, but let's just talk also about other ways that God has organized the leadership of the church. We see the office of elder in the scripture, and there's a second office that we see clearly in the Bible, commonly referred to as deacons. And that's a little bit confusing because that's another one of those words like baptize that they didn't really translate from Greek. They just took the Greek letters and turned them into English letters. Diakonos is the Greek word. Deacon is the English word, but it literally means servant. It's talking about servants in the church. Now, this word also can be a little confusing because it seems that it's used in a couple ways. It seems that deacon is used in the Bible. And again, you'll probably see it more translated as serve or servant, sometimes in a a generic sense, maybe lowercase d, deacon. Uh, that even what we looked at back, it was a few weeks ago, with distinctive number six from 1 Peter 4, each Christian, each part of the body is meant to serve for the common good. That's clearly talking about all Christians, and that's the verb form of the word deacon. But then there's other places where it seems like it's used in a more formal sense. Maybe you could call this capital D, deacon. Uh, and referring to an office of servant leaders in the church, of whom you see character requirements also in 1 Timothy 3. And again, we might not use that word a lot, but if you wonder, well, does, does our church have deacons? Well, we consider the deacons at our church to be the staff, those that are working for the church outside of uh, the pastors, our life group leaders, and also the ministry leaders who lead teams of servants in the church. And when you look at the scripture, this is an office of leadership. Uh, it really, through service, it's not an office of authority or teaching within the church. That, that is for the, the elders who, again, looking at our passage, they are commanded to shepherd the flock of God. So God is using that analogy of a shepherd with his sheep for the pastors. That's where the word pastor comes from. So what does that mean? that they are to shepherd the flock of God. 
I think if you just think about that image, what does a shepherd do for his sheep? Here's a few things that come to mind. And the first is they feed. The shepherds make sure that the flock is well fed. And biblically, we see that connected with the idea of teaching, teaching the Bible. And we see that, we see Paul use that, we see Peter use that, referring to the, the word as food or to, to solid teaching, even as, as meat as opposed to milk. But we see that throughout the New Testament. And so pastors want to make sure that their sheep have a healthy diet of the word of God. And that's why distinctives number one and two that we looked at a while back are the Bible is central and we showcase expository preaching. Because we want the word to be at the center of this church and of our meetings. Shepherds also lead. They, they just they lead the flock to where they need to go. And I think this is even described by that other phrase there in verse two, exercising oversight. There are just things that need to be overseen and managed in the church. There are decisions that have to be made. And they're not even all right and wrong decisions. A shepherd each day, well, hey, I'm going to lead my flock out to the pasture. Well, which pasture? We could go to this pasture today, or we could go to that pasture today. And it might not be a right or wrong answer. And that's where, as pastors, there's just decisions. Okay, well, where are we going to meet? How many services? are we going to have? How are we going to organize certain things? Who, who is going to be an elder and how many are we going to have? Right? Those are decisions that the leaders of the church need to make to lead and oversee the church. A shepherd, again, if you think about that image, also protects. A shepherd protects his sheep from predators. And we see that especially used of elders in Acts chapter 20 as Paul gives an, an emotional farewell to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. He warns them, hey, wolves are going to come into the flock and you as the elders, you need to protect the flock. And although the church, and that's really the context of First Peter, is we're going to have all kinds of opposition in the world and that highlights, well, we need strong leaders then in the church in a hostile culture. But when we talk about wolves and protecting the church, many times that is used to refer not to dangers from the outside, but dangers from within. Things like false teaching or division or just evil influence within the church that the shepherds need to seek to protect the flock. And a final thing, shepherds care for the flock. You think even of that image of a, a shepherd with a sheep over his shoulders, right? Uh, just taking care of a, of a sick sheep or an injured sheep. And, and pastors should care for their church. That could look like a lot of things, like biblical counseling. Someone that is in need spiritually. Hey, let's get into the word on a more individual and focused basis. Just care for those who are sick or hurting within a church. These are things that pastors are meant to do. So this is really answering the what question. What are the leaders in the church supposed to do? But Peter clearly cares about more than just that. And God does, because then he gets into how. How should the leaders do this? And you see that in the second half of verse 2 all the way through verse 3. He gives three opposites. Not this way, but this way. Not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, and not domineering, but by being examples. Let's sum it up this way. Point number two, lead with eagerness and example. Lead with eagerness and example. This is what God is calling the church leaders to do. And the reformer John Calvin, hundreds of years ago, wrote this about this passage. In exhorting pastors to their duty, he points out three vices, especially which are often to be found. And I think he's saying amongst pastors. Namely, sloth, desire for gain, and lust for power. And so that first one, not under compulsion. Uh, the, the leader in the church should not be lazy or begrudging. They shouldn't have the mindset, well, I'm going to only do what people tell me to do or what people asking you to do. Because one thing about being a leader in the church is, well, lots of times there's nobody telling you exactly what to do. 
And that's where church is different from business. But I think lots of times it helps when the leaders of the church have somewhat of an entrepreneurial mindset. And I think each one of those men, to some extent, needs to be a self-starter. Because when you start a new week as a pastor, no one just hands you a to-do list of, well, here's everything you need to do. You need to figure out what needs to be done to shepherd the flock of God. And there is a temptation for men in ministry to just milk that. Well, I'm just going to take all the Monday off, all the Friday off, and I'll put in a solid four hours on Tuesday through Thursday. And, you know, whatever passage I'm teaching on, uh, uh, you know, I, somebody else has probably preached on that, so I can just listen to that and, and preach that out. And you think, who does that? Plagiarism is actually one of the top three reasons why pastors get fired. Because uh, they find out, wait, he's been preaching somebody else's sermons and not giving them credit for it. And oftentimes, th that's linked with laziness. I'm, I'm not interested in digging to the, into the Bible myself. And I don't know why this has become popular, but sometimes in mean churches, well, there's a team that writes the sermon and just gives it to the pastor and he delivers it. Uh, that, that's becoming more popular. And again, I don't understand that. The pastor is meant to be digging into the word, to study the word, to know the word, and to deliver it to his flock. Should not be lazy or begrudging. You're going to have to go out there and, and get things done. And it's something, even just in general, whether it's a, at the pastor level or even a deacon level, that I don't think you should have to too strongly be talked into doing. Now, there may be times where there can be some encouragement, encouraging someone to pursue uh, serving God in a certain way. But the most common advice I hear from pastors to men who are interested in becoming pastors is, if you can do anything else, do that, right? Not because being in the ministry is so awful, but there are unique challenges of it. And if there's something else you'd rather be doing, oh, you're going to end up going and doing that. So count the cost before you go into serving God in this way. Way. It shouldn't be begrudging or forced, and then the, the pastor should not be lazy. The next thing really highlights greed, not for shameful gain. Now, that doesn't mean that church leaders should never be compensated. Paul in Corinthians and several other places makes it clear, no, the laborer is worthy of his wages, even though there were times where he voluntarily gave that up to serve a church, as we will see later. But that's not what it's saying here. It's even phrased shameful gain. The idea, again, of, of greed. And if you ever have thought about going into a pastor and you've thought, well, one advantage of that is I'll get rich. Don't do that, okay? Not a great mindset to go into ministry, but also, and again, unfortunately, you see so much of this in our culture of people who use ministry to manipulate others and receive wealth. Pastors that just live lavish lives of extravagance while manipulating people, often poor people and sick and hurting people, into giving money to them. That, that is that like exhibit A of shameful gain. And the pastor's mindset and even the deacon's mindset, anybody in the church's mindset should be, I'm here to serve and any compensation I get for either being a pastor or being on staff at a church, that's kind of an afterthought because I'm here to serve. And the whole point of the compensation is it frees me up to serve more. I think that's why when possible, churches should support their pastors in a way where they can uh, be healthy as a family financially. So then they don't have to worry about that. They, I can focus on pursuing Christ myself, leading my family and caring for the church, right? That's, that's all I have to really focus on and worry about because uh, a pastor or someone on staff at a church shouldn't be thinking, whoa, somebody needs counseling? Somebody's going to the ER? Well, how much are they giving to the church? Am I going to get paid overtime for this? Do you see how that would be a totally unhealthy way to think? You, you want the leaders in the church saying, there's a need? Boom, I'm there to fix it. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. An eager service of God. And, and finally, it says not domineering over says, those in your charge. Now, again, in our culture, unfortunately, some people view any kind of leadership as domineering. If someone stands up and says something authoritative based on the scripture, whoa, 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 that's too straightforward, right? Our culture is almost allergic to any kind of leadership. But the Bible makes very clear pastors need to teach, they need to make decisions, and sometimes they even need to confront or exhort so pastors should do those things, but this is really, again, highlighting how they do those things. 
And as one commentator put it, this shouldn't be done in an arbitrary way or an arrogant way or selfish or excessively restrictive. Pastors shouldn't be using threats or emotional manipulation or flaunting their power or playing politics within the church. Rather, it says the alternative to that is set the example. Set the example. And that's again why Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 really lay that emphasis on that the leaders in the church must be living exemplary lives. I even remember one time uh, reading a book that was written for pastors and people in ministry, and it was talking about the unfair expectations that people can sometimes have of pastors. And, and there are some ways that can be true, but it listed in a, a, examples of those unfair expectations that the church expects their pastor to be a model husband and father. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Last time I read 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, it seems like the Bible and God expects the pastor to be a model husband and father. So sometimes we, we lower the bar in this. It would it, if it would have said they expect their pastor to be a perfect husband and father, okay, now we've reached unfair. Because if you're looking for a perfect pastor, good luck. But what you should expect is a model pastor, an exemplary pastor, and, and leaders, and even in the other ways of leadership in the church. You should be able to look at all the team of your church leaders and say, I, I want my life to look like theirs. And this is essential because you want a sense when my pastor is teaching me something or even confronting me on something, they back it up with how they are living. And you can see when sometimes being in ministry can be a frustrating thing, pastors will be tempted to do otherwise, to start to become begrudging in their mindset or start to get frustrated and domineering in that way. And as our, our website even talks about with this distinctive. One great example in the scriptures of this is the Apostle Paul. Let's just look at one example of his in 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6, turn there with me. And if you've read through your Bible and know your Bible, you know that probably of all the churches that Paul wrote letters to, the Corinthians was the hardest. This was a difficult church. People were saying all kinds of slanderous, unfair things about him. Uh, there was all kinds of issues and drama in this church. But you see how Paul felt about them in 2 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 3. He says, we put no obstacle in anyone's way. And this is after he's called them. Hey, now is the favorable time. Today is the day of salvation. We don't put an obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. And even here, I think he's speaking of how in Corinth, that was one of the places where he gave up the right to any income from the church and he made tents just to, to serve them and make things as easy as possible for them. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, but verse four, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, right? Hey, when we're, we're telling the church, hey, when Paul's telling the church, you need to endure through suffering or persecution, he's saying, I I've been there. And then he talks about even just things of character in verse 6, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known. And here you get a sense of some of the unfair criticism, something that, well, nobody knows about Paul. No one cares about him. Or some people, well, Paul is too famous. He's too much of a big deal. How He can't win in the eyes of some of his critics as dying, and behold, we live, as punished, yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. That's the heart of a faithful pastor there, shown by the example of the Apostle Paul, or any kind of church leader. That This is the heart that they should have. My heart is wide open to the church. Even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, I keep loving the church. And now I hope you can start seeing how this, this applies to all of us. Now specifically, our passage is speaking to uh, the pastors, but guess what? The leadership principles that work in the church, 
They work anywhere else. They work in business. They work at home, right? This is how husbands and fathers should lead. And so even the focus of the application questions on the back will largely be, hey, how can I apply what I should see at church in healthy leadership in my own life? And this is how it should work when you study through a passage like 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1. You shouldn't just think, oh, great, I'm not a pastor. I don't need to care about these character requirements. You should say, hey, these are the character requirements God wants of the men who are supposed to be examples to me. So I should want to be above reproach. Men, I should want to be the husband of one wife or a one woman kind of man, as it's often put. I should seek to be striving for these same things things. This applies to all of you, but there's two other things I would encourage you to think about as you respond to this passage, and one would be to humbly ask you, please pray for your church leaders. Please pray for your pastors. Trust me, it is impossible as a pastor to read through a passage like 2 Corinthians 6 and not be challenged when you see the heart that the apostle Paul had. And I think any pastor should be thinking, hey, there's a long list of ways that I could be better. And there's a long list of ways I hope my church would be stronger. And if you ever hear me start to talk like, eh, I don't know if there's really any way I could be a better pastor, it's probably time for you to start looking for a new church, right? And any church that would be like that. You should want pastors that are always seeking and be, to be better and being challenged by the word. So please pray for your leaders and your pastors as they deal with the weight of a passage like this. And the second thing I would say is the world needs more godly leaders in the church. Even just very specifically our church. I'd say one of our greatest challenges from day one, especially that our church has grown, is always needing new leaders. We always need more deacons. We always need more pastors. And we need to see God raised up. One of the greatest needs of the United States of America is more godly pastors. There's a lot of pastors out there, but we need more pastors that are like this and that have godly character, doctrinal fidelity, humble cooperation. We need more pastors like that. And men in the room, God may call some of you to pursue that. Even in 1 Timothy 3, it begins, the one who aspires to the office of overseer He desires a noble task. So more of you need to say, hey, maybe I shouldn't be doing something else in my life, and maybe I should pursue serving God in ministry. And again, that's something you have to pursue humbly. Most men I know from the time it goes, I'm thinking about pursuing ministry to I'm in ministry, that gap is normally years long, sanctifying years long, because God has to prepare you. And if you're married, God probably has to prepare your spouse for that calling. But we need more and more men to step up and aspire to that. And we'll talk more about that next week with our eighth distinctive of working to plant more churches. So we see what the leaders are supposed to do. We see how they are supposed to do it. And he moves on then to why they are supposed to do it. And that's verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Hey, pastor, keep going and serve God faithfully in this way, because when Christ appears, you will be rewarded. And even just the way that's put there, talking about the chief shepherd reminds every pastor that they are just an under shepherd, serving the flock of the chief shepherd. So the job of a pastor isn't to get you to love them. The job of a pastor is to get you to love Jesus and to serve and follow him. Because ultimately, it's not the flock of the pastor, it is the flock of God. And any pastor, if they refer to their church or my church, it shouldn't be so much, well, this is the church that I built. It should be, this is the flock that God has entrusted to me. And there's a weight to that. There's a stewardship. But for those who take care of what God has entrusted them, there is a reward. Point number three, work for the reward of Christ's approval. Work for the reward of Christ's approval, which is better than any other kind of reward. It speaks of the unfading crown of glory. Now, any crown that would be given in Peter's day would have been made either of metal, which eventually can rust or corrode, or would have been some kind of laurel wreath that would eventually spoil. But here there is an unfading crown of glory. 
Now, there's responsibility that comes with that because that verse even reminds, hey, every church leader, you're going to stand before Christ someday. And you're going to give an account for how you handled his flock. And I think the more leadership you have in a church, the more accountability and responsibility that you have. So this is a very serious thing to say to pastors. But this is also should be a, a joyful thing. This should give motivation that a pastor needs because ministry can be a uniquely challenging and difficult job. But there should be joy in it. Don't get begrudging. Don't get domineering. Serve with joy because you know of the reward that is coming. Let's just say this week, I said, hey, I have a job for you. I need you to be a caretaker for this sick person this week. And this sick person is one of the most cantankerous people I have ever met in my life. They are rude. They are short. And uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but this is going to be a, a dirty caretaking. There's going to be things you need to help this person take care of, if you catch my drift, that is not going to be pleasant. And I need you to do this for this week, and then at the end of the week, I'll pay you $10 million. What do you think your attitude's going to be like when you're dealing with this nasty, filthy person? <laughs> I'm getting $10 million for this, right? This, this is worth it. Now, you're probably already seeing many ways that analogy really breaks down, as any analogy does, to what's going on in a church. But if anything, I would say it doesn't even do justice to the joy a pastor should feel. For starters, um, while ministry can at times be difficult and have its unique challenges, it is much better than caring for a nasty, filthy person, right? And ministry has its unique challenges, but it also has its unique joys, I, there's a lot of special things and rich things that you will experience in life through serving the Lord. And you also might think, well, that analogy doesn't work because a week really isn't that long. Oh, yeah? Well, look me up in 10,000 years and ask me, how long was our life? It, it was pretty short, right? And when you compare it to eternity. And you think, well, $10 million, that's a lot. Okay, well, what would you rather have, $10 million or eternal rewards in heaven? $10 million are the unfading crown of glory. And if you're thinking $10 million, let's have a chat after the service, right? No, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What Christ is offering us is better than anything this world can offer and anything that money can buy. So there's responsibility here in verse 4. There is joy here. There's also freedom here in verse 4 for those in ministry. One of my pastoral heroes, a guy named Warren Wearsby, he said that one time somebody came up to him after church and said, Pastor, it must be hard to keep all these people happy. And he responded, I don't even try to keep them all happy. I try to please the Lord and I let him take care of the rest. Now, again, that doesn't mean a pastor should not care about his people, but trust me, there is no way to please everybody. You, you know that from your experience in life. The goal is to please the Lord. And so... There is an example here, and I think this verse is specifically talking about a reward for faithful elders when Christ returns. But again, th this applies to everybody here, because you are all called, as we saw a few weeks ago, to serve the Lord in some capacity, and you are all promised reward. I think of Revelation 2 and 3, the letters to the churches, to the one who overcomes, I will give, right? Right? repeated promises of reward. I think of Matthew chapter 6. Hey, when you pray in secret, your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you give in secret, your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The Bible is full of promises for reward. I mean, some specifically like here to an elder, but also to every Christian. Every Christian faces the promise of reward. So these same things should provide to you responsibility. I need to be a good steward of the gift God has given me. They should provide you with joy. Because you, even if you're not a deacon or an elder, there will be many times you will serve the body of Christ in a thankless way. And you need to remember, I can do that with joy because I know God sees. And I know he knows. And there's freedom there. You don't have to please everyone. This again should be an example for you. Now, if we think about the distinctive, we will look to authentic and sacrificial leaders 
Uh, most of the onus of that falls on the leaders. They are the ones who have to be authentic, which by that we mean men of character and sacrificial. The onus falls on them, but the passage ends by reminding everyone of their responsibility. So let's briefly look at this. This will be point four, but let's talk through the text so I can explain what I want you to remember from this. Verse five, "'Likewise, you who are younger be subject to the elders.'" Now, again, here from the context, even the use of the word likewise and the context, I think it's clear elders is not just talking about old people here. And the principle here is not just that younger people should defer to older people, although I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. This text is specifically talking about the leaders in the church. So you may ask, okay, why highlight younger then? I think it is likely that Well, the younger people, they might face more of a temptation to be quarrelsome or argumentative. Even Paul, when he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy, tells him to flee youthful passions. And some of the highlights of what might those youthful passions be are a tendency to be argumentative and quarrelsome. So the leader, Timothy, he should not be that way. And then it gives the command you must be subject to the elders. Now, that's a strong term. It's not a term that speaks merely of respect or deference, but of submission to authority. And that's the the clear teaching of Scripture. Those within a church should submit to, put themselves under the authority of their church leaders. Let's just look at one other passage. If you're in Hebrew, or if you're in 1 Peter, just go back two books, go through James to the end of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 17. And this will be good for you to look at with your own eyes so that you believe I'm not just making this up. This is what the Bible says. Hebrews 13, verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, again, I want you to notice how even this passage, although it gives you responsibility, the onus and the real weight of it is still placed on the leaders of the church. They're the ones who are going to have to give an account to God, but they're going to be giving an account for your souls. So follow their leadership because that's advantageous for you. And that's where, again, you might be sitting there thinking, well, isn't that a self-serving thing for a pastor to say on a Sunday morning? And and trust me, I I know there's probably a lot of internal eye rolling going on right now. But but look at what the Bible says. And this is to your advantage. Is it self-serving for a parent to teach their children to obey them? I hope your answer to that question, parents, is no. That is what is best for the child. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying I'm anybody's father except for my own kids. The pastor-congregant relationship is different, but look at what the Bible says. It is not self-serving for a pastor to teach his flock you should obey your church leaders because the Bible is making it clear this is what is in your best interest. That's the end there in Hebrews 13. If your church leaders are groaning over leading you, that's no advantage to you. Or how it ends in 1 Peter 5 Getting to our responsibility to everyone, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Every one of us, we want God's grace, not his opposition. Therefore, be humble. This is God's teaching. So point number four, make your church a joy through respectful submission. Make your church a joy through respectful submission because this is where you will thrive and this is where everyone will thrive in this kind of healthy environment. And you see, this should affect your attitude towards your church leaders, but also this should affect your attitude towards everyone in the church. It starts with a command to be subject to the elders, but then it broadens that command, clothe yourselves, all of you, so again, this would even include the church leaders, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humility should be describing every relationship in the church. And again, the onus is on the leaders because they should be setting the example by leading with humility. And so you should respond with humility towards them and all of us towards each other. Church is one of the easiest places where you can start to feel judgmental or superior to other people. That is not God's plan for the church. Clothe yourselves with humility. 
a, a, a gentleness, a graciousness, a slow to be angry or frustrated, and a quickness to assume the best and believe the best and give the benefit of the doubt. That is what God is calling for within the church. And again, you need strong leaders leading the way in that. But every part of the body has a part to play. And again, if we ask the question, would you rather this be a healthy, strong church or a weak, unhealthy church? I think we're all choosing option A. If that's what we want, we really need to look to authentic and sacrificial leaders to be the kind of church that God wants us to be. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word and how clear it is in the instruction it gives us within the local church. And God, I want to pray for this church, that we would be a healthy and strong body here in the Treasure Valley. So God, I want to pray for the, the pastors of this church, that we would obey this passage, that we would really take this passage to heart and faithfully serve your flock with humility and gentleness and an awareness even of our own accountability to you, God. I pray for all that serve this church in any type of leadership, that these would be the traits we seek to live by and to exemplify to others. God, I pray that you would raise up more leaders within this church, that we would see more deacons, more pastors even rise up from within this church church so that we might see more healthy, strong churches planted. God, I pray that all of us even would leave here today with an attitude of humility, all of us seeking to apply what we have heard today and to pursue you. And God, we thank you for the promise of this passage. We thank you for the promise of, of reward to faithful church leaders. And we thank you for your uh, just amazing promises of reward to every faithful Christian. And God, I pray that we would live like life is short and eternity is long and that we would value your approval more than anything else in this world. So God, please help us. Please strengthen our church. Let us be a distinct church with distinct leaders and even just a distinct environment of humility and gentleness and love for one another. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.